Let me come to something you write about. It's a political development. It's one that everyone will probably remember. That day, in 2013, when young Rahul Gandhi in public tore up Manmohan Singh's ordinance. And Manmohan Singh and you were in America. You write in your book that he asked you for your advice whether he should resign. He felt, and I would say correctly, that this had damaged his image personally. It had damaged the credibility of the office he holds. Yet you advised him not to resign. Why? Yeah, let, he, me, let me, let me, uh, like almost every other press report of that particular incident, you're presenting it wrongly. It's not that Manmohan Singh was sitting there wondering, should I resign, call me in and ask my advice. What happened, as I report in my book, is that my brother, who is an IS officer who had just retired and started writing for the papers, wrote an article saying that, I mean, unhappy at what Rahul Gandhi had done, and sort of wrote an article that this is the right time for the prime minister to resign. We've been waiting for Rahul Gandhi to step out of uh, the shadows and take over, and the PM should resign. And now, he, much of he, the press in India thought her brother was right. Yes, uh, they took, I mean, you know, generally the press would invariably take up anything that embarrasses a sitting government. So they That's did the that. job of the press. But I think, I think what happened was that, you know, my brother sent me an email with this article and said, look, I hope you don't mind. I mean, I've written this and I hope it doesn't embarrass you. He, he didn't ask me in advance whether he should. I mean, he did the right thing and expressed his views, but he wanted me to know. So I thought that, look, I ought to be the first person to tell the prime minister rather than have some guy in his staff saying, you know, uh, Mr. Aluwani's brother has written this. So I ran across and said, I need to tell you this, that this is what my brother has written. So the prime minister read that article, and when he came to the bit where Sanjeev says, I think the prime minister should resign, he turned to me and said, do you also think I should resign? So it's not as if he was sitting there thinking but about... You, but the important thing uh, is, why did you say no? Yes, that's a fair point. You know, I tell you, my, I mean, you know, I have said that uh, the propriety of what Rahul Gandhi did and the way he did it is a different issue. And I, I said it was an unseemly way of doing it. And he himself later on said that maybe the words I used were wrong. And he said to the prime minister, he didn't mean any disrespect, etc. But I felt that, you know, to resign on an issue where a member of your party, not a member of your cabinet, a senior member, very senior member of your party, and a very powerful member of your party, has publicly expressed the view that what your cabinet proposes to do is not the right thing, okay? Now, you know, I think to resign on that issue, rather than to look at the issue substantively, is resigning out of peak. It's like, how can you do this? Uh, I resign. You know, I feel that uh, what happened was the prime minister gave out a, a statement saying, yes, the vice president has written to me, and we will discuss this when we get back. Let me now, frankly, you... uh, about 50,000 tweets should have gone out <laughs> explaining his position, but that he didn't do, which but is a mistake. But let me put the alternative to you. This was an event that not only embarrassed Dr. Marmon Singh hugely in the personal sense, it also demeaned and degraded the office that he holds. Worse still, there was such a public belief that he would resign because his personal integrity and reputation were at stake that when he didn't, many people became convinced that he was clinging on to office and sacrificing the last shreds of his credibility and reputation. And if you had said to him, it's a difficult decision, but I would resign, he would have emerged a man that people would look up to because he'd have sacrificed an office for his personal credibility and reputation. Instead, by not resigning, he emerged as a man who sought the spoils of office even at the cost of his reputation. And I that's the I, sad I, part. I really, I don't share that view at all because, uh, you know, you have to consider this, that if you're running a party with some kind of uh, freedom to express opinions, uh, you cannot object to a senior member of that party, a very powerful member of that party, expressing his opinion. And by the way, that opinion, as you imply, was shared by lots of people because that was not a particularly good ordinance. When 20 conservative MPs expressed their opinion about Boris Johnson in Parliament and voted differently, he sacked them. 
Yeah, but I mean, I'm not exactly sure that the current British Prime Minister is the best exemplar of traditional British practice. <laughs> Uh, so I think he won. He won an enormous majority as a result. Oh, absolutely! Look, Dr. Manmohan Singh, on the other hand, brought his party down to 44 seats. I'm not the sure lowest that, number no, they've no, ever I'm, got. I'm not sure that that was because of his not resigning. Let me put it that way. Which is because of the image of his no, government. I, look, I think uh, this projection of the prime minister, on the one hand, being a macho kind of person who decimates anybody who speaks against him. That's one image. Manmohan Singh's image is different. It's, a, it's that there's a complex country. There's a company, country with many different views. Uh, the Prime Minister should listen to these views and try to balance them. Now, these are two opposite sort of extremes. And quite frankly, given the complexity of the country and the fact that you need to hear different views, I'm inclined to think that the, uh, the second approach, let's tolerate differences of views and discuss them, is actually more sensible than simply a macho exercise of authority. Okay. I remember, I mean, there's a big difference in his position. I mean, as prime minister in a coalition government where the Congress party by itself did not have anything close to a majority, and he was also not the political head of the Congress party, I mean, he has to keep that in mind. You know, Rahul Gandhi's decision trashing the ordinance was as much an attack on the head of the Congress party, Mrs. Gandhi, the cabinet itself. So he wasn't just doing, he, he wasn't just complaining about a decision the prime minister had taken. He was complaining about a decision the cabinet had taken. So, I mean, it's an unusual, uh, unusual development and he didn't do it, uh, he didn't do it in a manner that would have been, let's say, ideal. If only government spokesmen in 2013 had spoken as you have today, the government might well have emerged unscathed. Do you see what you've done? You've explained what the government did. You've explained Dr. Marmon Singh's position. You've explained why, in fact, what people saw as his weakness might actually have been a strength. Maybe everyone wouldn't be convinced, but you made an incredible effort to put across a line of defense and argument that no one, absolutely no one in 2013 did. And you're a living illustration of why the UPA with good defenses, was unable to make them. You should have been the spokesman. Oh, but well, that's a different job. I mean, <laughs> that was not my job, by the way, as deputy chairman, to be the political spokesman of the UPA strategy. But, you know, I agree with you that I, I think that that particular government uh, was not actually, was not acting in a way that reflects an understanding of how much had changed in the way political parties communicate with voters and the public.